Well, hello and welcome to another Faith, Philosophy and Life with me, Mr. Shelton. I hope you're doing well. We're having lots of fun on uh, our Faith, Philosophy and Life channel. Well, at least I certainly am, even if you're not. But we're making good ho headway. We're starting a new unit today. This is called Good and Evil for those of you doing the Educast exam spec. And uh, we're going to be thinking about good and evil. And today we're going to be thinking about this question. Reasons for evil and suffering and responses that Christians may give to that and some of the issues re regarding the inconsistent triad. So what I'd like you to do is a little mind map or bullet point list about different reasons you can think of why there might be evil and suffering in the world. So have a look at that. Grab your pen and paper while you do it because here's our cheesy intro music. Okay, so evil is a big problem for Christians, and so is suffering. And it all stems from this, the omni-words. Can you remember what the omni-words are about God? Have a think, and then come back to me. Okay, so we've got omnipotent, which is all-powerful, omniscient, which is all-knowing, and omnibenevolent, which is all-loving. Let me help. There you go, they're behind me now. If you don't know what I'm talking about, get them written down. If you do know what I'm talking about, don't bother writing them down because you already know. The problem is that you've got is that if God is all loving, all knowing and all powerful, why does evil exist? Let me give you a daft, uh, daft little story of mine. Um, my little boy, he's not little anymore, but when he was small, we used to have a, a marble fireplace. And he uh, had one of those big balloons, you know, the big ones that bounce up and down with helium in it. And he had some string and he was pulling it down and he had his little first tooth there. It was dead cute. Okay, now imagine for a second that I am in the kitchen making a cup of tea. Uh, and the balloon pops and suddenly he's crying and his tooth is on the floor. You'd say I was a fairly neglectful parent, that may be true. But I would argue I loved him and I could rescue him if I knew about it. I just didn't know because I wasn't there. So if I wasn't all knowing, you would understand why he would injure himself. Now imagine for a second that uh, I was like my mother-in-law who really wasn't very well towards the end of her life. She loved him. She could see it was gonna happen, but she couldn't raise an alarm. She couldn't move. She wasn't powerful. You'd imagine what you could understand why that balloon would pop and his tooth would break. Now imagine for a second that it's me, the lovely Mr. Shelton, sat on the sofa watching it happening. I love him. I can see it's going to happen. But, and I'm strong enough to help him. Why then might I allow him to bite that balloon and to hurt his little tooth? Now, if I didn't love him, you argue and say I was a very cruel father, but I didn't love him, so it wouldn't be an issue. But if I did love him, why would I allow it to happen? That is known as the problem of evil. If God's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent, why does he allow evil to occur? There's one to think about where you get the title written down. So the title is, How Can a Good God Allow Evil and Suffering? And we're going to explore Christian responses to the problem of evil. As always, pause me as we go. It's going to be great. Uh, good if you can explain what the problem of evil is. It's going to be great if you can explain a Christian response to this situation I've just given you. And that's known as the inconsistent triad. And it's going to be even better if we can evaluate Christian responses to the problem of evil. Say what is good and what's bad about them. So we thought about all this. We've got a couple of media clips. We're going to mind map a little bit of analysis. And then an exam question as well. So before we move on, here's something from uh, Radio 4 or Open University. It's very good. And this explains some of the issues with regards to the free will theory. So let's watch this now. Yeah. 
We live in a world festering with moral evil, a world of wars, torture, rape, murder, and other acts of meaningless violence. In every city in the world every day, there are people deliberately inflicting pain on humans and other animals, and even enjoying others' suffering. There's also natural evil, such as disease, famine, floods, and earthquakes. This is terrible, but undeniable. For anyone who believes in the existence of a benevolent God, who is also all-knowing and all-powerful, this presents a powerful challenge, a problem, the problem of evil. How could a good God allow anyone to do such horrific things? If God is all-knowing, then he or she or it is completely aware of what's going on, and if all-powerful, could easily stop it. Yet the thunderbolts don't come. Many atheists have taken the existence of so much evil as conclusive proof that there can't be a good God, and that there probably isn't a God at all. The problem of evil seems to be a genuine problem for anyone who wants to believe that there is. One response, the free will defense, is this. God could have created human beings that always did the right thing, never harmed anyone else, never went astray, but that would have made us automata, pre-programmed robots. It's far better to have free will with the genuine risk that some people will end up evil than to live in a world without choice. That's the claim. Victims of Caligula, Genghis Khan, Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, Saddam Hussein, and the rest might disagree. And even if you accept the free will defense, it doesn't explain natural evil. Okay, the next thing then is I've got another clip from Seedbed, which I think is just brilliant. It talks about privation, talks about where evil and suffering may come from. There's another worksheet in the description below. Please access that, and that will go. You, that will the, the questions will take you through the video clip we're about to see. So, uh, pin back your ears, get that uh, worksheet up, and let's get this answered. Let's watch this now. What is evil? I'm not talking about that red guy with a pointy tail and horns protruding from his forehead, or a supervillain with a PhD. I mean the bad stuff happening around the world. What is that? What exactly do people mean when they use the word evil? Simply put, evil is the corruption of something good. Here's an analogy. Have you ever considered that counterfeit currency is the corruption of real currency? Now notice, you can have currency without counterfeit, but you can't make counterfeit currency unless real currency exists to begin with. Similarly, evil could not exist if good didn't first exist, because evil is the corruption of good. When we call something evil, bad, and wrong, we're presupposing there's such a thing as good, right, and correct. And when we declare that evil is bad, we're revealing our belief that things ought to be good. For example, if someone steals your car, you'll probably call the police to report a wrong committed. This reveals your assumption that there is a right or good way that things ought to be. I think you can see then that the subject of evil naturally leads to the question, what is good? So we said it'd be good if we could explain what the problem of evil is. Hopefully now you've got that boxed off brilliantly. Great if you can explain the Christian response to the problem of evil. And uh, that's where we really are going now. So I'd like you to um, mind map for me uh, these uh, with, with these responses to why evil may exist. So you'll again need to access that information below and you'll find a grid there and it gives you lots of different reasons as to why Christians might say there is evil and suffering. What I'd like you to do is once you've mind mapped those and put them around your mind map, I'd like you to explain which one you think is the strongest argument, which one you think the weakest argument is, and uh, why you think what you do. So let's get that done. 
pause me now and then come back to me in probably about 10 minutes or so time. Okay, so uh, this is our sort of exam question for this session. It's just one question. It's a D question. It's a 15 marker, so it will take you 15 minutes. I suggest that you use Farmy for, against, rebuttal, my opinion, and if everyone. Um, but remember, you don't have to. Remember, you do need to try and use some quotes as well, and certainly religious terms. So I suggest you try and think about some quotes you could possibly apply. This is the question. An all-loving God cannot allow evil. An all-loving God cannot allow evil. Discuss this statement showing you've considered more than one point of view. So, um, you need, as I suggest, sort of four paragraphs, a four against rebuttal, which is a third point of view, and in my opinion, and if, if everyone, maybe throw a fifth paragraph in there if you can. Give yourself 15 minutes. I'm going to go through how to mark it with you afterwards. So, pause me now and get that done. Lovely. So hopefully now that is done. Um, can you please make sure that you obviously photograph everything and send it through to your teachers? The grid behind me is not very clear, but you know this is kind of will take you through what you need to do to start off with. So the first thing I'd like you to do is to underline any terms that you think might be classed as religious terms. So the omni words, Bible, Jesus, God, um, inconsistent triad, um, anything that Anything you think that could be classed as a religious term. Let's do that now. Let's underline that and uh, then come back to me. Okay, so that's the yellow highlight on the screen behind me. You'll see it says use limited for a band two. That's between four and six marks. It, if, you, if you interpret some religious or special language, that's seven to nine. If you use religious language uh, appropriately and with detail, that's 10 to 12. And if you use it um, extensively, that is 13 to 15. So that's your first sort of thing. Now the next thing is sources of wisdom and authority. So I want you to now go through and out, put a circle around any uh, quotes that you have used. All sources of authority could be church teaching. So put a circle around now any quotes that you think you've used. Now, if you can just make it out over my shoulder, a band four is and, religious terms and sources of authority. So if you haven't got a source of authority, you cannot be scoring above nine marks. It is as simple as that. You've got to be using Bible or catechisms or something like that in order to be getting 10 or above. And obviously that's what you'd be aiming for. So um, with that in mind, it comes on to our last thing. It's poor, limited, good, very good, or excellent. That's the blue highlight there. So if you think your answer is poor and you haven't got, really got any religious terms or source of authority, I hate to say it, but you're going to be scoring no more than three. If it's a limited statement of one viewpoint, uh, you're going to get between four and six if it's got religious terms in it. You're going to get between seven and nine if it's good, generally good, and uh, it uses religious language. It's got more than one point of view, so you've done a for and against paragraph. That would be um, a three, a band three between seven and nine. For a band four, it's very good. So you've done your four against rebuttal, in my opinion, uh, using terms of sources of authority and quotes. And for a five, you've gone the whole hog and everything's in quite a lot of detail. So that's how you'd score it. So maybe set yourself an EBI and even better if as well. And then come back to me when you're done. Beautiful. Okay, so let's just get this wrapped up. We said it'd be good if we could explain what the problem of evil is. Great if you could explain the Christian response to it and why Christians think uh, how they could respond to it. And even better if you can evaluate that. So here's some true or false things. Is that true or is that false? Just write true or false down in your book. Then come back to me. Is that true or is that false? Is that true or is that false? Is that true? Is that true or is that false? And lastly, true or false? Okay, so that is false. Transcendent is to be beyond time and space. That is true, that is true, that is false because it's out of nothing, 
And that is also false because that would be the definition of dominion. Stewardship is looking after the world for God. So there you go. And on that bombshell, I should leave it there. Thanks very much for your time. Take care of yourself. Stay safe. Wash hands. God bless you. I'll see you soon.